Turning to John 3, and we'll begin to read at the first verse. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of, heaven, of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but not <coughs> tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Reading to the end of the 11th verse. Last week we began a series of messages on uh, steps to heaven and looked at the first couple of steps, uh, repentance and faith. Uh, that's where it really starts. Can't get to heaven unless we uh, repent of sins and past and uh, then put our faith in God. But there is uh, other, another step in preparing ourselves to, uh, for that wonderful assurance of heaven, and that is to receive it. And that's what uh, Jesus was talking to uh, Nicodemus about, receiving this, uh, this gift or being born again. There's a story told of a man that uh, was on death row and uh, word was uh, sent to the governor, he had word sent to the governor expressing his regrets for what he had done, we call that repentance, and uh, asking for pardon and a promise that uh, he would uh, not do that again. Well, a pardon came as he was on his way to the gallows. Thinking it was a cruel joke, he refused the pardon. And that's sometimes the way with us spirits, isn't it? Whether people think this whole thing about being born again is a cruel joke or how they interpret it, uh, many people just refuse it. They don't receive it. But Jesus says that we must receive it. And he said to Nicodemus here, except a person be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Uh, here was Nicodemus' problem. Then. In verses 10 and 11, it says there that uh, Nicodemus uh, uh, said to Jesus, Art thou a master? Or Jesus said to Nicodemus, Art thou a master in Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto you, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. Isn't that sad? Receive not our witness. Jesus himself testified, telling Nicodemus of his need and the solution for it, that he can be born again, he can have that wonderful experience, and yet he didn't receive it. 
That's a sad situation with many people today. A lack of receiving what God has offered for us. When Jesus went to that cross of Calvary, he paid the price that uh, whosoever will, as the scripture says, can come unto him. And it's only those who do come, those who do come in repentance and faith and receive this gift of salvation, this gift of a new birth, a new life, a new start in life, a new uh, promise of the future, a new home in heaven. It is for all those who will come and receive it. He has already paid the price. It's like uh, uh, if you get one of these gift cards and you uh, can go to the store. Now, the gift card doesn't do anything sitting in your pocket. You know, it doesn't get you any richer sitting there. But it's only when you cash that gift card in that you get the product, whatever it might happen to be for it. And Jesus has paid the price of our salvation, but it's only when we cash in on it, if you'll excuse me using that, that term to tie it together, that we receive it. And so the opportunity is there to, for each one of us to uh, come to know this saving power of God, the salvation that he has promised, and a home in heaven that's assured for all those who will receive it. Though <clears throat> one may know all about salvation, but if not born of the Spirit, he does not have the spiritual life that Jesus paid for. Now let's this morning just quickly look at a, a number of evidences of being born again. How do we know? Sometimes a person might say, well, how do you know you're born again? Well, what are the evidences? And maybe more important, how does somebody else know that we are born again? So we want to look at it from those things. And we're going to go through these quickly because I have a lot of points to, to cover there. First of all, there's a peace that comes to us when Jesus comes to abide in our hearts. Oh, the peace that Jesus gives. And in uh, Paul writing to the Colossians in uh, the third chapter and the 15th verse, he said, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Be thankful. Let the peace of God rule in our hearts. He can give us a peace that the world cannot take away. It cannot give it. It cannot take it away. It's a wonderful peace. We sing a lot of songs about uh, the peace that we have through Jesus Christ. The world is not at peace. I don't have to tell you that. You can get that on the newscast every day of the week. They know that the world is in turmoil. Well, it always has been, and it will be until Jesus comes. Uh, but uh, we can have peace in our hearts. When the angel sang that on uh, the birth of Jesus, that he came to bring uh, uh, peace on earth. And some people say, well, we don't see much peace on earth. Well, you look in the wrong places. If you look at the news, there's no peace on earth. If you look around about us, there's no peace on earth. But when we look to Jesus, who abides in our hearts, there's a peace in our heart that the world can't take, can't give and can't take away. And it's that peace that he brought. Oh, it's so wonderful to have peace in our hearts. Isn't it good to be at peace? Oh, I trust that each one, I believe those of us here, uh, know that, that peace in our hearts that, that Jesus gives. And I trust those that may be watching on the internet that they'll experience that peace. And if they do not know it now, that there is a peace that God gives. And uh, uh, the peace that we can have with God and a peace with others and with ourselves. See, that's a big problem with people with regard to peace. They're not at peace with themselves. And until they're born again and trusting Jesus Christ, there is no peace within. And with no peace within, how can there be peace without? And that's why the world is in such a turmoil today. But when we accept the grace of God and are born again through the Spirit of God, there's a peace that Jesus gives. 
There's also a divine life that we experience there in uh, 1 John chapter 5 and uh, verse 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. There's, a, there's that joy, that satisfaction, that, that assurance that uh, everyone that believeth in Jesus is born of God. The new verse, as he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He says to all, we must be born again. We have to have that new birth, that new experience with Christ, that we belong to him, we're brought into his family. It gives us a desire for God and his will and an assurance of eternal life after this one is passed by. And there's freedom from condemnation. Oh, it's terrible to face condemnation, isn't it? To feel that sense of guilt that so many people are living under. And uh, deservingly so. If they don't know the Lord, if they're living in sin, away from God, they should be condemned. They should sense that. But praise God, we can be free from that condemnation, that sense of guilt and uh, the sorrow that it brings. In uh, Romans 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's the only way to be free from condemnation, to accept Jesus into our life, to let him abide, to experience that new birth, to be new creatures in Christ, walking not after the bold, sinful ways, but walking after Christ. That's what he says there. Not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Letting the Spirit of God guide us. And we'll say a little more about that later. But this divine life that he can give, and this lack of condemnation, this freedom from it. Sin brings guilt, but uh, God frees him from that. And uh, even those who have not heard the gospel know the, the sense of right and wrong. There's, there's something ingrained. In fact, uh, I, I, even a dog will know that, you know. You come home and Rover's there to meet you every day at the door. You know how dogs are. They're the greatest welcoming committee, you know. Uh, they come with their tails wagging and uh, anxious to greet you and meet you. But then one day you come home and Rover isn't there and he run, he's run and hid under the bed or something. And what do you say? Well, what did you do wrong? You know, you know he did something. He knows it. Even a dog can know. Uh, and people are supposed to be more intelligent than dogs. They say that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, step one in training a dog is that you have to be smarter than the dog. And that's why some of us don't know how to train dogs, I guess. But uh, there's that sense of condemnation that's there. But when we know Christ, when we're born again, we're free from condemnation. Oh, praise God. That's something to get excited about, isn't it? Therefore, now, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Or we might say them that are born again. Also, the person that's born again does not habitually sin. Uh, they might fail sometimes and slip, uh, but, and I'm not making any excuse for people to do that, but, uh, you, might, but you don't have it. You uh, 1 John uh, 2 and 1 says, uh, These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And then he says, But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If somebody does slip, and sin. We have an advocate. But the purpose is to sin not. And the person that is born again and living for God doesn't uh, habitually sin. They don't continue on that way. They're free from that. Sin is an intentional uh, disobeying of God. Now some, I know, broaden the term out until it loses its meaning, but really it's an intentional 
uh, disobedience of God. But the person that's born again doesn't do that. They don't intentionally. They might slip, as they say, occasionally, but they don't intentionally. It's not their habit. It's not their idea. They don't want to sin. It hurts them when they do slip and sin. Their intention is to live for God. That's an evidence of being born again, that we have that new desire to put him first. It's impossible to walk with God and the devil at the same time because they're going in opposite directions. And so we're walking with God. We want to keep him. Also, the uh, person that's born again confesses Christ as their savior. They're not ashamed to, uh, to say so. That's... Uh, says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, a song that we sometimes uh, uh, sing, isn't it? But in uh, Romans uh, 10 and verses 9 and 10, it uh, says, uh, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confess with thy mouth. Give a testimony to God. Let it be known that we belong to him. <clears throat> a person that's born again does not rely on their own goodness but it relies on Christ, not ashamed of Christ. Jesus said that those who are ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of them. But uh, the person that's born again has no shame. They're living for Jesus Christ, confessing him. Let the world know. And there's deliverance from the world's ways, not struggling all the time, trying to be good. A lot of people, you know, they... They know what's right and wrong, and they, they try to, but they're always failing because they're trying in their own strengths. But the person that's born again has God's strengths, and uh, they uh, can uh, live that way. They, they're delivered from uh, the, uh, the world's ways. Going back to 1 John again in uh, chapter 2 and verse 15. The writer says, uh, Leave no, <clears throat> love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If the love goes to the things of the world, oh, the non-Christians, all they can think of is uh, the, the pleasures of the world, uh, uh, getting money and getting comfort and getting... Uh, of fame and these things, but uh, the person that's born again is living for God, and we can see that in their lives. That's one way you can know if you're really born again. Are you living for God and not for the things of the world? And other people can recognize it. That's why sometimes somebody will maybe say to a Christian, uh, maybe they don't know them, they met them, they've seen them at work or something, they come up to them and say, oh, you're a Christian, aren't you? And you might say, well, how did you know? Well, I can tell by the way you live. I can tell by what you're doing. Uh, we're delivered from the ways of the world. We're living a new, a different life. And we have the witness of the Holy Spirit. Oh, praise God for his faithful witness to us. The Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are a child of God. Look at Romans 8 and uh, 14, where... Uh, he, he says, uh, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Sons of God. Isn't that wonderful? To know him, to be led by him, led by his Spirit. The unconverted are led by the devil. They're usually not aware of it. They think they're doing their own. They say, I'm doing just doing my own thing. They think they're doing what they want to do. But in effect, they're doing what Satan is driving them to do. They're captives. They're not free. But when Jesus comes into our life and we're born again, we're set free from that. Free to live for him. Free to enjoy the presence of God. 
Sometimes we sing that chorus, uh, uh, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, free to live, free from sin, now I am. What a joy it is. What a freedom it is. When we're led by the Spirit of God, he helps one to avoid sin and to please God. And the one who is born again uh, <coughs> possesses Christian love. Christian love for one another. Uh, Jesus said in uh, John, written in John 13 and uh, 35, says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. If ye have love one to another. Christians are, real Christians are known by the love that they show for, for one another. Sometimes we can show it outwardly. Uh, sometimes it's more from the heart. But it's, there's a love there, isn't there? Uh, that's one thing I... Notice in this church, and I, the, the love that people have, the acceptance, and I hear it over again from different people, you know, the sense that no matter who you are, come in, you can feel loved. And, and we feel uh, uh, very uh, frustrated, I guess you might say, right now because of this virus that we have to keep this distance from one another. That's not our style. Uh, we are the type of people that like to shake hands, and a lot of you like to hug one another, and, and just show that love to, to one another. And uh, I think we still show it, but uh, trying to show it from six feet away is a little more difficult, and it's hard for us. Uh, some people, maybe that's no problem, but uh, for us it is. But it's that Christian love that it flows out of our hearts, and and wants us to uh, show it to others and to, to welcome them. Uh, Christians are known by their love for, for God and their love for one another, as, uh, as he said there. Uh, this, Shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye love one another. Love that gives, forgives, and seeks no benefit. Some people, they love us just, well, what do I get out of it? That's the attitude of the world, isn't it? What do I get out of it? But as Christians, we say, what can I put into it? How can I love others? How can I express that to others? How can I help them to know the love of God? And then, uh, the last point I want to point out here is that for the Christian, there's a desire to be holy. The person of the world is looking out for themselves and their interests and what they get out of things. They're not desired, don't desire to be holy particularly. In fact, they'll sometimes uh, uh, mock it and make fun of it. But when we really know God, we want to be more like him and he is holy. Sing that song, so holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Yes, he is a holy God, and he calls for a holy people. And when we're born again, we have that desire to be like him, to be a holy people in the midst of a very unholy world. But we're not bound by the world. We're set free from the world to live victoriously for Christ. And in 1 John 3, and verse 3, it says, Everyone that has this hope in him, purifies himself, even as he is pure. This hope of heaven that we have when we're born again and have that assurance, it's not the type of hope that says, well, you know, I, I hope it'll be a nice day tomorrow with no ground for it, you know. But it's, a, it's a hope as an assurance, something we can hold on to, that uh, we know is a sure thing. I think that the term assurance would be better than hope, really, but we often refer to it as hope. And uh, John says here that we uh, have this hope in, in us. Then we want to purify ourselves. We want to be all that God wants us to be. He wants us to be a holy people as he is holy. 
He wants us to live a holy life because it's the best life for us. It's a life of freedom and joy and peace and satisfaction. That's the life he wants us to have. That's a holy life. And so the person that's born again wants to live a holy life. I trust that they go on to the experience of heart holiness so that we can live that way in a, a holy life in a sinful world. Not looking for the least demanding life, but a consecrated life. Want to be more like Christ. More like the master I would ever be. More of his grace and purity. Yes, that's, that's the goal we have. Oh, I trust that's the goal to each one here today and listening on the internet that uh, they have that desire to be more like Jesus. And as we grow more like Jesus, we grow more in holiness. We have a pure life, a life that's pleasing to him because he is pure. And we want to be that way. These are some of the desires. We ran through a lot of them, there are about 10 of them there, that marks of, uh, that reveal that a person is born again. What, how do they appeal? Are they true in your life? Are you demonstrating them as you live day by day, wherever you are, to demonstrate that you are born again? And if not, if you're not living that way, then, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. It's the only answer. It's the answer that's needed. Are you experiencing these evidences of being born again? If not, you need that new verse. As he said, except a person be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And probably those of us here today knew them. But I suspect there might be many out there listening on the internet that do not know that. And if so, I'd invite them to just call upon God in prayer and say, confess their sins and accept Jesus and say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I want you to abide and guide me day by day. Oh, friends, wherever you might be, Make that your prayer.